But when you come to transition metal oxides, for example, the transition metal D and rare earth F, these orbitals are in space very narrowly defined, very tightly defined. So the, they are so localized that you can talk in terms of very clear identity. And as you'll see also in the experiment, that how you can very easily identify something that has a transition to D character or rare earth F character. And the oxides when I'm talking about, so the nearest neighbor is an oxygen ion. So it can hop to the oxygen site. So transition metal D is mixing with oxygen P via this hopping. But that hopping energy is such, it is reasonably large, larger than what in the case of 4F would happen. But it's not large enough to completely obliterate the character of the 3D electron that the, it starts with. So basically, the approximate description that you're saying Okay, then my starting position is going to be, I will take a 3D atomic orbital on the transition metal, I'll take an oxygen P orbital on the transition metal, and then I'll, I'll allow mixing between them because of hopping back and forth. And I'll solve the problem within this approximate limited basis. Because, remember, we are trying to solve a problem which is very, very complex, right? Every transition metal side, every metal side that and all the 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, all these electrons. And then I have infinite number of them. So if I try to do a complete analysis of it, then the matrix that I showed, that I said you have to diagonalize, will, the, its, its dimension is equal to the number of basis vectors I take. And if I have to take all the basis vectors, then it becomes huge and impossible to solve. So I'm trying to do an approximate solution. When I'm trying to do an approximate solution, then I'm saying, what is the minimum basis that I need? Here's something that I'll show you how one constructs it later. And the minimum basis, when you have identity, when your final wave function is dominated by characters of one atomic site or the other atomic site very well, which means that in the final eigenfunction, the contribution from one side is much higher than the other one. And in some of the eigenfunctions, the other side has much more weight than this one. That's a good point to have tight binding application. Simply because the final wave functions that you are after, which are solutions to your Schrodinger equation, have predominantly one atomic character or predominantly another character. So this is the basis where we apply this tight binding model. And that's why in transition metal compounds, as well as in 4F, etc., the tight binding approximation works. All right? But again, you'll see how it can be built up by analyzing and looking at But let me get back to giving you a feel for the experimental situation. Because all theory is actually motivated by at least all theory in condensed matter science today, over the last 40, 50 years are motivated by experimental results. So we need to understand the experimental results. So let's start with the simplest oxides of transition metals. So what I've taken, 3D transition metal, which goes from titanium to copper. And I've taken no <coughs> oxide of it, PoIO, BO. I've struck out CRO because that doesn't form, it doesn't exist. MNO, FeO, CO, NIO, C. So what I'm doing is in the periodic table, I'm going across the period, across, starting from titanium all the way to copper, all of them with their monoxides. Mm -hmm. And I ask, what is their problem? Remember, periodic table was written down by Mendeley, one of the greatest intuitive genius that I've ever known of, was based on the fact that there's a monotonic behavior of properties. When you go along the period, along the period or down the period, there's monotonic evolution of the properties, and that's how he could write down the periodic table. He even left blanks, knowing that some element would be discovered in the future, which would fit into there. I mean, that's mind-boggling. Every time I think of Mendeley, I get goosebumps even today. So there is, ought to be a monotonic behavior properties, which is wonderful. Now, if you look at it, it turns out that these are metallic. These are insulin. 
And so one would say, okay, fine. Maybe the monotonic behavior is starting from a metallic behavior, becoming more insulating, and so I have still retained the understanding that it's a monotonic behavior. Then I take another oxide example to convince you that monotonicity is the first casualty when you talk about these kind of interesting materials. All that I've done is take another, here I've taken monoxide, here I take a structure type that's called a perovskite that you don't have to worry about. All of them have lanthanum and three oxygens, and this metal M is going to make an titanium to copper. So I'm going to talk about this. This series turns out that the titanium, lanthanum TiO3, is almost metallic. In fact, in 1994, we all believed that it is metallic. It's a very small gap insulator. These are insulated. This one is very insulated. Cobalt is also insulated, but nickel becomes metallic. So there is absolutely no monotonic behavior. I start by being very metallic, almost metallic. I become increasingly more insulating. This becomes very insulating, and then becomes somewhat insulating, and then it becomes again. And if I look at their magnetic, okay, here is the, what do I mean by very insulating? I can look at the band gap or the resistivity behavior. There is a publication from Gangulium, Prakash and Sienna Law from way back in 76. So when you can see, there is a band gap across the series. It starts, at that time, one new lanthanum titan to be metal. So it has a zero band gap just like lanthanum. It's only in 1994 that we knew that it slightly should move up. And the band gap increases, becomes maximum, then again decreases to become metal. Resistivity also, of course, follows the similar. So that monotonic behavior across a period is completely lost. If I come back and ask the question, what about magnetism? It turns out this is, if it is metallic, it's not magnetic, but it is, becomes weakly magnetic in the insulating state. These are magnetic, becoming very strong magnet for the iron. <coughs> But cobalt becomes non-magnetic and this is polyphenomagnetic, which means non-magnetic. This is essentially diamagnetic, one believes that it's a diamagnetic, and has a diamagnetic to magnetic transition as a function of temperature, and this is non-magnetic. Magnetism is also non-magnetic across the field. And this immediately begs for an explanation, because this is very, very counterintuitive. And this is when we understand, we'll say that, okay, we have understood how to understand the transition to loss. Magnetism is intimately connected with the electronic structure, so I'll not, I'll take a slight detour because I'll not talk about too much of magnetism, but let me throw a few questions and a way of broadly thinking about magnetism quickly before I turn to the electronic structure. This is a periodic table that you all know of. These are the rare earths, these are the actinides, they're filling somewhere out there. This is the 3D transition metal, 4D and 5D. And if I ask which are the magnetic elements here, it turns out that there are very, very few magnetic elements. That's chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel. And the rare earths here. That's all that the magnetic elements are. There is electrons, there is spin, and yet very few elements that are magnetic. And why are these? And they also don't seem to appear in any relationship with each other. What is it that makes something magnetic and something not magnetic? And what is the periodic element strength that I can see in magnetic elements? Turns out that you don't see any. Now, there's a different way of thinking about it. So I have extracted the rows that are important for magnetism because these are open shells. In fact, these are all transition elements. There is a 3D, 4D, 5D, 4F, 5F transition elements. And what I'm defining when I'm saying 3D, 4D, 5D, etc., this is the orbital which has unpaired, not fully filled, not totally empty shells, so it can in principle <coughs> support magnetism. But you have seen that all of them don't support magnetism. Right? And how do I understand that? What I propose is to rearrange this periodic table in a particular way. The way I would rearrange this periodic table is this. What have I done? I said that the orbitals that are responsible, can be responsible for magnetism, are these 4F, 5F, 3D, 4D, and 5D. 
So what have I done? What I have done is to rearrange them in terms of spatial extension of these uh, orbits, atomic orbits. 4F is extremely localized atomic length. So they have the shortest extension. And systematically, as I go this way, they become more and more extended. So I have taken the freedom to rearrange the venerated periodic table of Mendeleev in this way. And then I find that in this way, and then ask, where do I find magnetism is associated with the fact that I have not only unpaired electrons, but these unpaired electrons are localized. And if I ask the question, it turns out that these spaces, those partially failed levels, represent very strongly localized moments. Neodymium, rubidium, samadium, europium, all these have very localized moments. By this time, of course, they're all fully filled shell, but they're very localized D levels. And on this part, those electrons are very, very delocalized. Here, if we talk about the 5D electron, this has no F, of course. But if we talk about the 5F electron here, 3D electrons here, in the elemental state, these all the D electron of vanadium is also very delocalized. So these are very delocalized. And now you find that this is the no man's land that's where the crossing between very localized to very de delocalized nature is happening. In some sense, it's expected because remember, what we did was to arrange this is the most localized end, that's a delocalized end. So as I'm going down, I'm delocalizing the electron. But there is something else that I'm doing to make that side also more delocalized as I'm going that way. And that is something I'll come back to. It is the strength of the electron-electron interaction. Because as the orbital becomes those narrower, it pushes the electrons closer together in space. So obviously, electron-electron interaction will increase. So it's not only that the, by making the orbitals more extended in going down this way, so that they have better chance to hop away, which means the hopping integral, hopping strength is large, which helps it to make form banks in solid. That increases in this direction, so it tends to get more delocalized. In this way, it gets more localized. But also at the same time, in going across, because if I'm going from that side to this side, remember the nuclear charge is increasing. So the potential is attracting the same, in this case, let's say the 5D, in this case 4D, it's making it contracted. The wave function is collapsing as I go across in this direction, and therefore it gets increasingly more electron-electron interaction. And electron-electron interaction, as I'll show you later, also leads to localization. So in this way, localization increases because of the bandwidth is decreasing. In this way, localization increases because electron-electron interaction is increasing. So you have this diagonal behavior in this direction, both electron-electron correlation Interaction as well as the bandwidth uh, contraction makes it very strongly localized. This end becomes very weakly localized. And you have this peripheral ones where it's in the no man's land, where depending on the situation, temperature, pressure, partner element, you can make them go across, you can make them very delocalized, very localized. These are the places where these are the kind of elements which give rise to all kinds of interesting properties of magnetism, metal insulated transition, depending on the partner element and other physical parameters. Yeah. This is very fascinating. And actually, uh, I'm recalling my PhD days. Can you tell me roughly, you know, then if you move on to statistical mechanics, you apply Heisenberg model. And mm -hmm. So Heisenberg model obviously will apply only to the localized system. But for delocalized, I mean, we also, at those days, I used to go hell of people with stonar magnetism, itinerant magnetism. So where in the periodic table we have stonar type magnetism? See, the stonar type magnetism, you still have these are the ones that were in the elemental stuff. All these are deleted to the stonar type magnetism. Because that's where the DD bandwidth is still very nice. You have Coulomb interaction, of course, but the solar magnetism is then applied to only the elemental or metallic systems. 
But in the oxide system, because you have that D isolated by oxygen, P is all out. The D bandwidth is seriously high. So that's when you bring the Hubbard or Anderson type. So with the advent of IPC, I guess, our focus has shifted now to oxide. Before hydrogen, sorry, this is a private talk, I'll just complete it. Before hydrogen synthesis, didn't know that there is any other orbital other than S orbital. Right? It's IPC that forced physicists to look at the 2D, 3D orbitals for the first time. That there is a structure to the orbital which has very important consequences for the properties. Sorry. This is a where electrons seem to be metallic, conducting, and at the same time it seems to be a thousand times heavier than a free electron. How can such a heavy electron move around? And not only that, it seemed that only that very heavy electron made it superconducting. This is a phenomenon that we still don't fully understand. Similarly, uranium also gives us many heavy forming superconductors. This manganese, colossal magnetic resistance, Right? Iron, nictites, cobalt, thought of magnetism, nickel -ates. very rich physics today going on. And palladium, ruthenium, rhodium are also being looked at now, and iridium, those have also become sort of known as that. We can push them into many interesting superconductivity as well as metal insulated transition and, uh, and magnetism. So most of the interesting things is in this. <coughs> And how do we make it more interesting, less interesting, as I said, by putting them in different compounds? Because elemental ones are everything's fixed. But I can change the property of this localization and delocalization or increasing the Coulomb interaction. Coulomb interaction increasing is a bit more difficult but can be manipulated by putting different kind of partners all around it. Because remember, as was shown in the morning, that the hopping, that it will hop from one side to the other, She's only going to put two identical simple harmonic oscillators. But remember, the two simple harmonic oscillators that are overlapping with each other could also be like that. And then, a lot of interesting things can happen by tuning how much of this, how much I shift their energy, and how much ability I give them from, to hop from one side. And all that can be done, and that's where material science, materials physics, materials chemistry, come in in a big way. Because now we can enhance and tune this localization, delocalization effect, getting all kinds of different properties. So, is it only happened only because the band width broadens or the band gap changes? I mean, this type of band gap changing is a consequence. <coughs> and I'm coming to band gap and defining all that. Two things happen. The band width changes, that is the delocalization effect, I said. The, when you have essentially large hopping